To introduce you to our panel of today, it's on the left is uh, Rogier Fischer from Hadrian, and he will uh, maybe a short introduction. Yeah, uh, uh, in English, I assume, right? In English, if you want. Uh, no, I'm, I'm Rogier Fischer, I'm an ethical hacker, been ethical hacking since I was about 12 years old, and uh, I'm now one of the co-founders of, of Hadrian Cybersecurity, which is here in Amsterdam in London, and yeah, well, basically we, we use AI not necessarily to, uh, to well, some of the things that we're going to talk about here, because I think that AI and cybersecurity, and especially on offensive security, is not really there yet. But we use it mainly in, in uh, building breadth into our simulations um, and, and adding uh, <coughs> flexibility around some of the uh, well, context that we're building. But we can go a little bit deeper later, but that's really why I'm, I'm okay. here today. Thank you. Yeah, to his, uh, to his left is Anuj from the, from the UVA, maybe a short introduction. So, hi, my name is Anuj Prathania. So, I'm an assistant professor at the uh, University of Amsterdam in the Parallel Computing Systems Group. And uh, my one of the re topics I'm researching is on uh, Edge AI, how to get these models, ChatGPT models, like ChatGPT working on embedded devices like your mobile phones and handheld devices. And that's why I think. I have some idea about what to say today. Okay, okay yeah, and uh, Erik Kostelaar. Yeah. I'm Erik van der Kouwen. I'm uh, also an assistant professor, but at the other university in Amsterdam, namely the Vrije Universiteit. So my background is in system security, so I'm basically uh, doing research into hacking and so on, um, which is all at a very, uh, very low level. I don't really have expertise in AI, I should say, um, but I'm very interested and I did uh, Try to figure some stuff out with uh, with ChatGPT, um, but so my background is very much in security, though. So I'll be uh, highlighting the security issues that I see, at least with uh, with the, these kind of systems. Okay, thank you. And then I'm myself, I'm Marcel Ruiker from uh, Decipher, and uh, yeah, Decipher is the platform for cybersecurity innovation. And I see some colleagues here in the room already. Safak and Christian is downstairs in the main hall trying to direct people to the right, uh, right location. So, um, yeah, the, the setting is for today is to, uh, to have a general view of how, uh, how these, uh, these models like GPT-4 GPT will evolve, what, what are they, what are the possibilities, what are the dangers, more in general uh, sense. And Anuj will give you some insight on that. And then, uh, yeah, then Eric will follow to, to dive a little bit more deeper in the cybersecurity uh, possibilities and, and threats of people. And then at last, will as, uh, as owner and founder of Hadrian, give some insight in the uh, yeah, future of, uh, of startups or scale-ups. I think Hadrian has already scale up more, I guess. Uh, and we call ourselves a startup. Start there, there's start many different uh, definitions. But uh, yeah, also a little bit more on the product side, like how can we, uh, yeah, what, what, what's the future for companies like you? Uh, for this? And yeah, we already see a nice, uh, nice picture here, of, uh, probably generated at Mid Journey, <laughs> one of the other uh, AI generative uh, uh, tools that are recently uh, on the market. So yeah, maybe Anuj, uh, I'll give the word to you and. Uh, yeah, sure. Take it. So I've been asked to predict the future with AI. I should start with a warning that uh, I think I don't think anybody can predict the future, least of all a computer science professor. But <laughs> let me give it a shot. So I assume that everybody has here really used, I means have seen, at least heard about ChatGPT. But how many of you have actually used ChatGPT, at least registered for it and data pin? Now, another question I wanted to ask, how many of you have actually used ChatGPT to do something useful? And I mean really something useful, right? So when you just go to ChatGPT and you do some searches and you get really impressed by it, from the output it came in and you are like really surprised, how can a computer give such kind of answers? They have never given, right? But when you really, at least what from my experience, I used recently ChatGPT to design a it's written exam for a master course I'm giving. And when you really start to um, use this tool for something really useful, right? It means written exams is a very tedious job for a professor to create. Every year you have to come up with new questions because students have data because of last question, last year papers and so on. Right? So it's a very tedious job. I wanted to charge ability to do it. 
But, uh, and I was thoroughly impressed by it before I started using it for something useful. So, in my opinion, these tools are very impressive, but uh, uh, are they leading us towards uh, what they call AGI or general intelligence? I don't think so. I don't, in my personal opinion, I don't think AGI or artificial general intelligence is going to come from these tools. Um, and uh, so if you really use these tools, I think you will find them much less impressive, much less intimidating. But uh, of course, these tools are going to be constantly improving over the near future. So that's my take on this whole thing. So I prepared a few slides. As I said, this is the AI generated image. I wanted to put a AI generated image on my top of my slide. It was not generated by Mid Journey, but it was generated by ChatGPT using Bing, which uses ChatGPT4. And a picture are, is worth thousand words. So I think uh, if generated text is impressive, I think generated images are even more impressive. And uh, um, at, at least for me, I think this is the current state of the art. Because nowadays the digital art created by these generative AI tools is very impressive. And uh, this is one example. Uh, I just gave it a prompt generative AI and this is what this came up. And there are a lot of opportunities with these kind of tools. For example, this is a Japanese manga, which is a Japanese comics, uh, which is very popular not just in Japan, in the rest of the world, and I'm a very big fan. And only recently, in uh, uh, March this year, they use a Japanese supercomputer to produce a Japanese manga which was completely generated by AI. And this used to take a lot of effort by a lot of digital artists uh, to generate these kinds of uh, comics. And, but this became viral in Japan and it became, it became an instant hit and it led to a lot of controversy. It means I feel bad for the digital artists, right? Their bread and butter is being hit here. But uh, there was a lot of controversy. There were people saying whether this is really art or not, and what does this mean for the whole future of this whole manga and comics. But I think this is the opportunity. There's a lot of things which are going to be shaken up by this generative AI technology, even in its current form. But this is about opportunities. I also wanted to talk about threats, and since this is a security community, I think it's more interested, people are more interested on the negative side of things, right? So, <laughs> so that's why I'm going to spend more time talking about threats. So this is, I think, a couple of days ago. So this was a picture generated uh, using AI. And this is a picture of, uh, the prompt was to have a serial bomb blast in Pentagon. Uh, so there's Pentagon in background. And this picture went viral on internet. But that's not the worst part, right? I mean, the worst part is that this is like a screenshot from a live Indian television, broadcasting it uh, on live TV. <laughs> saying this, that this is real, right? And it's not that they, only the Indians were believing it. When people in the US were starting to believing it and there was a big dip in the stock market, till this was proven that this was a fake news. And somebody looked, showed the live feed of Pentagon that it's still there, right? So, uh, so AI-generated fake news is now coming on live TV, right? So I think that should ring some bells uh, about what is going to happen in the future. But in future, uh, we are gonna go much beyond images. So I think the near future, we have the low hanging fruit is like AI generated videos. So we already seen what a deep fix can do, but with these new tools, which are going to generate videos for us from the start, from a text prompt, you can probably generate any video you want uh, to some extent. I mean, these tools are not good. This hardly looks like a very clownfish, probably looks like a clownfish, zombie clownfish. But these tools are only going to get better, right? So, like we have digital art, which is hyper-realistic now. I'm assuming that they will have hyper-realistic videos. But what does this mean, right? It means when you, you have these tools at everybody's disposal, then means how would we identify true videos from for fake videos, right? Right now, in la, a court of law, uh, images are permissible evidence, videos are permissible evidence, sound recordings are permissible evidence. But once these kind of tools become commonplace, right? I don't think that anybody can claim whether it's true or not that this is, means anybody on the defense can claim that these all evidence are generated using AI and all our deep fakes or whatnot, right? So uh, we are moving towards a future where these tools, with the, because of these tools, we will not be able to generate 
uh, differentiate between what is true and what is false and means in uh, wrong hands it can be easily used for mass manipulation uh, I think this is one of the big threats uh, which is uh, AI is bringing and uh, but uh, in particular I think there are also a lot of opportunities so my research is more uh, mostly about embedded systems and edge AI so I, these models currently are very big but uh, they cannot really work on your mobile and they are all running on big data centers because they are very huge in terms of their processing power and the power consumption and so on but I think when these devices uh, maybe in the next five years when they come on your handheld they can be personalized that will take away a lot of issues like privacy and so on means one tech I'm really hyped about is that uh, means maybe in the near future we will have like a universal translator in our ears which are doing live translation of whatever we are listening uh, into our own local languages and coming from India where we speak 22 languages in just one country where two Indians cannot talk to each other when they go 100 kilometers from their home I think this kind of tech will be really dope right so besides threats I think there's a lot of good things which would come out of this also so here I would rest my case and I'll ask other panelists about it yeah, maybe some questions uh, to, to, uh, to you from the, from the audience. Yeah. So one question is if you generate the questions for your students by uh, AI, by uh, ChatGPT, then students can ask, uh, of course, also ChatGPT, which questions can I expect for my next uh, exam? Or yeah. Means it could, but means I think that. So my question is basically oh. then the fundamental part of it is. Will it then leak the information that generate for you to the students? Because so, they would say, well, actually I know a lot of these questions and there they are. Which uh, just passed to you. Yeah, it could be, but uh, sometimes the questions Did which I... Uh, it would be nice to check it. Yeah, but some of the questions I generate really needs domain knowledge, so you have to really guide chat GPT in the direction you want them to be. You start with a basic question and then you can ask it, uh, make a question harder and then do 100 time regenerate response and it will generate 100 questions maybe 10 of them are useful right but you can make it work much more efficiently yeah, if you I understand don't. but the student can ask of course uh, in another room uh, what questions can I expect are there harder questions uh, and what good to answer yeah so I actually told my students that uh, they should use chat GPT to prepare for the exam <laughs> yeah yeah it's very good practice it, because I think uh, it also gives leads to a lot of more understanding of the domain. So we are used to seeing right answers from computers, right? When we do use calculators, uh, we when we multiply two numbers, we, uh, we get a number out, and we are pretty sure that this is the right answer. But these tools are different. So when you ask chat GPT something and you get an answer, you cannot be sure that this is the right answer. And then everything, everybody is confused. Even I am confused sometimes. Whether chat GPT is giving the wrong answer, my understanding of the answer is wrong, or whether the prompt itself was wrong. So it is even simply wrong because there are now examples circulating. Uh, uh, one uh, chocolate bar costs 20 cents. I have uh, two euro. How many can I buy? And then it will answer 25 or something. And then you say, is that true? Shouldn't it be a little bit less? And then it answers 23. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, these examples are now circulating. Yeah, but it's true because it's never it's never giving the same answer again. Yeah, uh, people will believe. But people will believe, and, and that's no, yeah. The problem is, of course, that or problem. Chat uh, GPT looks for words that are close together statistically, and all these uh, things, uh, in all the all the uh, information that went into it, and therefore it comes with these approximations. Uh, it but I, do it it it, it, I think it's important to realize that that's not necessarily the deterministic process, right? So when you are asking to generate 20 exam questions and he's asking to generate 20 exam questions, you will not necessarily receive the same 20 questions. So unless there is, there, you are literally using the same machine, the same model, and, and everything around is the same, which is just simply not the case. Yeah. Yeah, it's the prompting, the, the prompt, the exact prompting. What you say is make uh, is is. is but even if you use answer. exact same prompts, you yeah. are gonna get two different. Yeah, answers. also yeah. But that, that's what I need to try to say is that it's uh, you use from computers that you uh, you point in uh, some data, you get an answer. And the answer is right, but with uh, 
but these models, it's, uh, it, it's a prediction of the next word. And when it's, it's the system is alive, so the, if you ask it just before or after it, the, the answer can be different. And, and I think that's what I, what I really like what you said, is that you don't think this, this, the language models that we have right now are the frontier that pushes us to ABI. I, I agree with that because right now we are building language models and they're great at generating language, but they don't factually understand the subject, subject that you're talking about. And, and it, it's a vastly different because even if it generates test questions for your exam, doesn't mean that it has any clue what it's asking. And, and that is something that we would need to at some point call it actual API. Yeah, so uh, the whole computation problem that, that we just discussed is just a different topic. But, but, uh, so my first question was about does it leak information under the hood? Which is why uh, many companies now forbid to use it because they are afraid that the system learns from what you feed into it and that somebody else using a lot of words from the same topic get that information back uh, somewhere else. So, if so that's the kind of underground... Uh, I fully it. agree with that. And I, and I would recommend any company not to send any sensitive data to OpenAI. Yeah. That's and my question was basically to him, if the students use many of the same words from the course, but can he then under the hood get the questions that he got? <coughs> anyway, but... Uh, I think uh, the bigger uh, side of that is actually on, uh, on programming and uh, programs that uh, can be generated. And that's maybe a nice bridge to... Yes, uh, that is one of the to areas I need to bring up. So uh, Eric, uh, maybe you can up. take over from it. Yes, so I don't have uh, slides, but I did uh, prepare uh, some, uh, a story about uh, threats introduced by uh, generative uh, AI or maybe uh, AI more generally. So. Uh, the first thing people think when they think about the threats of AI, they think of like the Terminator or something like that, right? <laughs> so I don't think that uh, ChatGPT is going to get us there, exactly as he said. Mm -hmm. It's just a language model. It's, uh, it's really good at language, but not, not necessarily at other stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no new uh, threats being introduced by these kind of models. And I would like to divide the threats into basically two types. Uh, the ones where people use AI for nefarious purposes, so they can use ChatGPT to, to, to do something bad, but also uh, one can actually attack the AI itself when it's being used for legitimate purposes and uh, misguided to do the wrong things. So I would say those are two completely <coughs> different ways in which um, AI can be a threat, but both of them are, are going to be very important. So let's start with using AI for attacks. So I'm a teacher, of course, I'm an assistant professor, so I teach. So the one that hits closest to home, and probably for all, all the other people here in the room from academia as well, is students using this to cheat, right? So it kind of came up to some extent already, and I fed it my exams, and you also did actually, you got less good results than I did. Um, but it, surprisingly gave, it gave surprisingly good results. So I teach some very advanced courses that, that many students fail. Uh, but it manages to, uh, and this was actually the old ChatGPT, it manages to answer correctly about 50% of the questions. Um, and it does this in some impressive ways. So uh, I asked a question, for example, about it, my courses are in, uh, in system security, so uh, finding vulnerabilities in code is one of the important aspects. Um, so I had a question where there were seven vulnerabilities hidden in some code that I wrote, uh, which was made deliberately vulnerable. And basically I asked it, uh, give me the vulnerabilities. It found and nine. It found eight, uh, indeed. <laughs> so that, uh, it found all the vulnerabilities that were intended to be found, uh, plus another one that I did not realize. <laughs> so this is common. If you write code like that, intended to be vulnerable, you're sure to introduce more vulnerabilities. I've often found this in the past. But it was interesting to see that it did such a, such a good job there. Of course, this is very simple code, code that actually fits on an exam sheet. So it's not necessarily representative of larger programs where it's much harder to actually reach the code that you want to, uh, that you want to exploit. But still, I think it's an interesting, uh, an interesting thing where you see that it can be used in bad ways, right? So you can actually use it to find vulnerabilities. And that might be because you want to fix them before you release your software, but it could equally well be because you want to, uh, to exploit them. 
Well, of course, all the students use uh, ChatGPT to write papers nowadays. So uh, one of the teachers at the, at the VU asked the students how many use, uh, use ChatGPT, and there were two thirds willing to admit that they did. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that there's going to be many more that actually also use it, but don't, uh, don't admit it. So it's interesting yeah. to see how incredibly fast the uptake has been by students. So you can easily check it. You just feed the text to ChatGPT and ask it, who, do, who wrote it? No, this is terrible, actually. So I, this, this is actually something that, uh, that some professors are doing, and apparently it gives a lot of false positives. Yeah. Uh, so you can actually try this with texts that were written before ChatGPT. And it and says basically, it was written by me. <laughs> Well, yes, so these, these, these uh, AI detectors are basically completely bogus, even now. And the, the better ChatGPT is going to get, and the other technologies are going to get, the worse those detection technologies are sure to be. So personally, I find that I, if I, I received an email from a student written, clearly to me at least, written by ChatGPT. I asked the student, um, and, and he admitted, uh, because he felt that he couldn't write good emails. Which is interesting, that is actually true of many students, but now apparently they, they use ChatGPT. Yes. <laughs> but he was completely surprised that I could recognize, uh, because it has a very, well, predictable structure. But in general, I think the detection is a dead end. So I don't think these, these tools are going to be detectable in the end. What's the policy uh, of the university? So the basically, all, all of us, all the universities are now scrambling to make policies. Right. Um, so for me personally, uh, the policy, and that is mostly also what we adopted as a department, the policy is that you have to hand in your own original work. Uh, so it, if, if you have ChatGPT write it, it's, it's plagiarism basically, or fraud. Uh, it's, you, could, you can debate whether it's literally plagiarism, but it, we certainly consider that to be fraud. However, there are also good purposes, right? So if you use it as a grammar checker, basically something like Grammarly, that is perfectly fine. So the thing is, the student themselves have to uh, have to produce the content, um, and that brings me to another point that I, that I found with students using ChatGPT, um, or actually its its predecessor in terms of code to some extent, uh, GitHub Copilot, right? So GitHub Copilot is also a tool to generate code. It came a bit a bit ahead of uh, ChatGPT, but ChatGPT can do uh, similar stuff, and in assignments, so. It, for those who are not uh, who don't teach computer science, it's staggering how many computer science students cheat. It's really amazing. Many of them plagiarize from earlier years from other students. Uh, some of them pay other people to write stuff for them. It's really really bad, <laughs> and we have a very hard time just coping with the sheer number of uh, students plagiarizing. Um, and of course, it used to be the case that many students copied their code from, uh, from Stack Overflow, which is a well-known website where you can ask questions about coding, basically. Right, so, and I mean, that used to be a big issue as well already. And now they were using Copilot. This was before ChatGPT, but still fairly recently. And one interesting thing that we saw was that there were very unlikely errors in there, right? Memory errors, like the kind of errors like buffer overflows that you can exploit. So people used to copy their code, and the students, I think, they are a representative of programmers as a whole, right? Students will copy their code from Stack Overflow, programmers will also do it. And I'm certain that uh, many programmers will also use Copilot and ChatGPT for this purpose. And it's interesting to see that it can write code that looks kind of okay, is sometimes functionally correct, but incredibly bad in terms of vulnerabilities. So it's completely riddled with memory errors that a normal human would not make, and that would be called if they were found on, uh, on Stack Overflow. So there's also going to be an issue if we have so many programmers who struggle to program themselves and use these tools without being critical of what it produces, this is also going to be really bad. It okay. creates a lot of vulnerabilities. Exactly. So it, cre it actually creates new vulnerabilities yeah. if you're not careful. It's only when you assume that they, when they don't use it, they don't create vulnerabilities, and it isn't. The oh, case. they certainly do, right? So it just it seems to be even worse, sure. uh, because now they don't really have to understand the code to write it. I think uh, that's, that, that, that's the main thing. Yeah. Um, we must understand what we are doing, but we don't have to write code anymore. My programs, I expect from my programs that they use ChatGPT. I don't want them to uh, make code themselves because ChatGPT produces better code than than they do. They have to check. 
Yeah, and so if, if the code is correct based on their knowledge from the code right. and then from the theory of the code, not the code itself. The code itself yeah. is important. Yeah, so from my from what I've seen from my students, the code was typically far worse. Uh, but this will get better over time, no doubt. And then indeed, it's very well possible that it might be better. Alternatively, I guess you could have ChatGPT generate the code and then ask it to check it afterwards. Yeah. In which case, it might actually the code can be correct because you can uh, use the right functionality. But it's not very secure, right? So exactly. So these kind of vulnerabilities are are ways to exploit the program, even if it works for a normal input. Basically, if you supply, for example, far too much input, you may be able to take over control. Right? That's the sort of thing that uh, that it introduced in the student's code. And that is something to, to be concerned about, I think, because if people don't know what they're doing, they won't see this sort of stuff, right? And this, this is, I think, yeah. a big issue. And is that maybe also one of the issues that, uh, that the corrector, uh, like, ChatGDP, more people using it, the more people <laughs> generate the same sort of code. And there's, no, uh, there's no reference. The reference will, will be farther away. Uh, yeah. So we actually found many. Uh, we, we actually found many students cheating this way because they actually handed in the same code. So and when when asked about this, they said they were using Copilot, co which is supposed to create original code. But I think they probably just pasted whatever is is in the assignment literally, and then the same thing, or at least largely the same thing comes out. So you can spot it. But again, this will be harder to spot in the future. So that is just, I mean, I've only gotten to the point of the students yet. I have so much more to say, but I already know it's not going to happen. <laughs> so let me go through a number of topics very, very quickly, uh, because there's, there's really a lot of dimensions. So binary analysis, as I mentioned, you, you can use ChatGPT to analyze code, find the vulnerabilities, and create attacks, right? So we used to have script kiddies, uh, kids who just downloaded code of the internet, or maybe even the predecessors of the internet back then, and just ran it and used it to create a virus, right? So this will go, get even worse, because now more people have access to this sort of thing. Um, you can use ChatGPT to pose as a human, right? So we have CAPTCHAs all over the place, and at this point it's gotten to the, the point, I think, where these CAPTCHAs are often harder for humans to solve than for computers, <laughs> right? And ChatGPT will make this even worse and will allow all sorts of abuse of systems that are intended to be protected against that. Right? And deep fakes is also basically another case where computers can impersonate real things. Right? Writing scam emails is a big one, right? because now, um, now you get the same spam a hundred times over, and at some point you and also your spam detector will see, okay, wait, this is probably bogus. But if it can send out personalized emails to everyone, it becomes much harder to spot. Right, and another thing, and that's like yes. Uh, um, I run semadvisor.com, and we do see a lot, uh, an increase already, uh, also in deep fakes. Um, but to what extent? Uh, I think at, at the beginning of your speech, you said we cannot use the same software actually to identify misuse. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not convinced that AI detectors work. So there's there's a lot of stories recently about many false positives being there and people using this to check older texts, uh, which may to some extent have been the input, of course, for ChatGPT, right? So it's trained on existing texts. And it just flags a lot of false positives. So I'm somewhat concerned that if we're going to rely on these tools, um, we're going to be wildly inaccurate. So I think it's going to mean that students who write good prompts can still get away with it. Um, at the same time, I think we're going to uh, incorrectly flag a lot of cases. Um, because even if, according to the claims of the people who make this stuff, I think it's like 85% accurate, right? So if, if it says it's, it's, it's AI, 85% is supposed to indeed be AI. Uh, from what I've seen myself, I highly doubt that number, and I think it's far worse than that. Um, and if people use this stuff uncritically, it gets even worse, right? So uh, all the academics here probably know software like Turnitin that will match uh, papers against papers that were written before. And then you know even if the percentage of matches seems very high, uh, you always have to look at what it actually matched. And in many cases, for example, it will match the bibliography. Right, which is naturally likely to be the same over and over again. So you always have to be critical about the result. And with these AI detectors, they basically don't give you any information why it thinks it's AI. So you cannot have a human check it. So personally, I think we should 
entirely disregard them and look for other ways. So what we are planning to do is uh, move to a model where every course has some component that was done in a controlled environment. So that could be a written exam, it could be oral exams about the assignments that you've done. And this part will be required to get a sufficient grade to be able to pass the course. So they can still cheat on their exams, but if they're clueless, they will not pass the course. Right? So uh, it's, 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 I think, for now, the best we can do. But it relates a bit to the next point I wanted to mention, and this is also, I think, really cool. What you can also do is you can train AI systems, and that doesn't really apply necessarily to ChatGPT, but this is already being done for other kinds of systems, uh, against mitigations. Right? So you can actually have your own AI system and pit it against one that has a defense in there, and have it try to bypass the defense, right? and look at the responses, and come up with the best way to bypass all the defenses. This is another way in which you can use AI to do bad things. So those were the things I wanted to say about my first part, right? Using AI to do bad stuff. Uh, the second one... One, one question. Yes, you sure. You mentioned uh, twice now bad stuff. What is bad? That is a very good question. So you can... Uh, so if, if I want to, if I can give a formal answer, it would be breaking, at least from my domain, it's breaking the CIA properties. So confidentiality, availability, and integrity. So it means leaking confidential information, um, breaking a system in such a way that it's no longer available, or uh, manipulating a system in such a way that it does its job in a harmful way. Um, and these are, I, I think, mostly examples of that, right? So if you train um, AI to bypass mitigations, those mitigations were in place to make sure that, for example, you don't leak confidential information. Right, so actually, so the, between the CIA properties, so people running a nuclear power plant will think differently, um, but system security people like myself typically think confidentiality is the most important one. So um, if, if we break something, we can always have a spare, right? Um, but if, if you leak information, that is really bad. And basically, so any activity on those three properties are considered bad. Yes, those, those so three. Even good. if it's done by good agencies or. Hmm. Yeah, so then it depends on how you, how you define your threat model, right? So if you, if you run a system um, and, and you want to keep the information in it confidential, right? Then if you have a legitimate interest in keeping that information confidential, I think you can, can say that is a legitimate attack. That's a bad thing. Uh, it becomes a lot more murky and, and ethically difficult if you're talking about um, attacking, uh, for example, another country, right? Let's say we want to leak information about Russia's attacks on Ukraine. It becomes more difficult, right? It's, you're doing a good thing, but it's still an attack in a way. And if you view it from the perspective of the people owning those systems, then it is actually a bad thing, right? And the same goes if you go against cyber criminals. And it gets even more difficult, and this is also already being done, um, if you actually attack, in a way, systems from legitimate users, but you do it with the intention to do good, right? So a system is vulnerable, um, which means it will be infected by malware, most likely, when it goes onto the internet. Now we also use the same vulnerability to get into the system, and we remove the malware. Right? That seems like a good thing. It's something that has, to some extent, also been done. Uh, but the risk is that we break this user system, right? And then you get into these these really traditional ethics questions, like the trolley problem, right? So is it worse to do something for good, but break something, or not to do anything at all, even though you know something is good? Those are questions that I cannot answer, then you need to get someone from the philosophy department. Right? <laughs> yeah. But there's a lot of ethical questions, there, so, and they relate strongly to the question, what is good and what is bad? Yeah. So I would like to comment on something. So as, so as it's written in academia, right, I mean, different universities are following different policies reading regarding this generative AI. For example, big Ivy League universities in US, they are starting special courses called prompt engineering, which are basically teaching students how to use these tools for uh, in their daily life, right? And on the other hand, you have like University of, uh, I think, HKUST, Hong Kong University, which have banned, completely banned chat GPT or any other generative tool on the university campus and uh, penalizing students for using it, right? So there's, again, no consistent policy, right? Some people are wholeheartedly adopting it, some people are not. 
But if you look at when, uh, for example, a student goes out of the university into the real world, the companies are wholeheartedly accepting these tools. They think these tools are the future. They are believing that uh, there will be no software developer who will not use this tool. And then you train students, uh, assuming that these tools cannot be used or are, should not be used, or maybe you turn them against these tools, right? But then they go into company and real world, which says, oh, why are you not using these tools? There was a very good article which I read, which basically said that you will not, a person will not be replaced by AI, but a person will be replaced by a person who is using AI better than you. Yeah. <laughs> right? So if you, if you prepare your students to, means you, you should prepare your students for the real world, right? So, so uh, <coughs> in the university research council, so the, the USA, that's the highest council that uh, talks about research, we have exactly had this debate about the uh, impact of ChatGPT on teaching and on research and so on. And all these arguments were also coming by, so I was actually the oldest present there, so I told them, listen, I've had this before. Uh, about 40 years ago, you got the uh, uh, calculator, <laughs> you know? Oh, the students no. will not be able to compute anymore. <laughs> they will not be able to add two numbers together. Yes. You know, now it's totally embedded. Ten, no, years later, you got, <laughs> 10 years later, you got uh, Mathematica. Oh, the students will not be able to solve any equation or differential equation anymore. And now it is, uh, we even uh, got Nobel Prize winners in it, uh, like it Hoofd and uh, Veldman, uh, who uh, used actually these tools. So, and now it is totally common. So I completely agree with what he says. Uh, um, I think in a few years from now, it will just be one of the tools. But that doesn't rule out that there are actually quite a lot of yeah, other issues uh, behind it that we really need to discuss. Yeah. Not necessarily the good use of the tooling and all that will come back and we need to train students in it. But there are also uh, um, other sides for it. Yeah, there are many other sides to it. And maybe that's, uh, that's a nice point for our, our, our last uh, guest there at the end, Rogier. And maybe you can share uh, your point of view, but then more from a business uh, perspective on these uh, on cybersecurity issues. Yeah. When uh, reflecting to chat uh, GPT and those foundation models, because the part is also available uh, since uh, a few weeks when you have uh, a VPN and can log into a United States uh, VPN account. I mean, there's, there's many, uh, there's many the alternatives. AI tools available. Um, the stuff is saying that we, all of our developers also use uh, the GitHub Copilot or any of the other tooling to uh, facilitate that. And even our platform itself has an AI chat agent that our customers can interact with to understand the data that we present. Maybe um, you, can, you can say a little bit about yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there. But I think that some of the issues that you highlighted are very well. Um, so if, if I'm looking at this problem of cybersecurity and AI, we should definitely differentiate a couple of things. And then I, I already mentioned it at the beginning, the current AI models that we're talking about are language models, and that's what they're good at. And they are incredibly well positioned to make phishing attacks, and they're seeing, they're seeing them in the wild. But if you're looking at the 3.5 billion of phishing emails that we're sending every day all over the place, less than 10 million are actually still being generated with AI. The vast, vast, vast majority is still very boring and plain. And I think that that is probably the first real problem that we'll start seeing emerging from AI. I don't think in the foreseeable future we'll start to see advanced threats, advanced technical exploitation happening because of AI. And I'll tell you well why. If you're looking at the threat landscape right now, and especially if you're looking at vulnerabilities, which I think was already a bit of a topic here today, the majority of attacks that are happening today are already in a completely fully automated fashion. It's, it's a script kitty or some hacker somewhere that is scanning the whole wide internet, not necessarily to target a company, but to target a technology, to target a package or software. And at that point, the only real reasoning why AI would potentially be helpful there is to help that program. But reality tells us that it's actually already very easy. 
And, and comparing security and measures that we take compared to 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, it was very different. Security through obscurity was still a thing. We, we, we just hid things on the internet, and if they were not well known to be somewhere, you were most likely not going to get compromised. Nowadays, because of the scale of, of which these attacks happen, and depending on the day they first put, it's between 20 and 25 percent of, of internet traffic sometimes. At that point, it's, it's really a question of when and not if you will be compromised because you have that problem. And, and that is really where AI comes into place as a solution and not necessarily as a problem because it, it cannot necessarily accelerate the problem. The problem is already there. But the solution is there in the sense that AI can help us build systems that can monitor for these problems at scale as well. Where you can have a single platform or tool or AI that is basically capable of doing what well, hundreds if not thousands of script kiddies are doing manually or manually setting up these automations. And, and that is basically the premise that we started Hadrian on. So Hadrian is a cybersecurity company that does offensive security monitoring at scale. We visit every single IP address in the world, at least IP4. IP6 is a different question because there's quite, quite, quite some out there. But IP4 addresses, we visit them every day a couple of times. We try to assess what technology is running there. But more importantly, we try to assess is this actually relevant information for ourselves? We're incorporating OS into NetFlow data and, and all these types of tooling. But most importantly, we are building a, uh, also a large aspect of our platform. And I think the differentiating aspect of our platform is the AI component about interpretation and context. It's about understanding what technology are you running where, when is the, uh, did things change, and, and also to a certain extent business context. How important is this to you? And an AI is much better suited for that. And I can give you some examples of tools where we definitely incorporate AI, but it's in things like naming conventions prediction, like name conventions. Like every company has their own way to describe things, has their own way to name their assets. And a tool is generally used to basically predict where these assets are, and that's used by hackers and malicious actors. And it's scanning. Yeah, it's Even if it's not intrusive, already permitted, because you're scanning all IP4 addresses. Oh, that's, that's perfectly fine. You're the same when you visit the website. I know, but <laughs> that doesn't mean if I can do it, it's still allowed. Yes. So sending a, sending a very simple ping is definitely not uh, not permitted. The the actual threat modeling and threat simulations. If you're not in the Netherlands, it's quite illegal. In the Netherlands, we're pretty much protected by regulations. But in reality, you always need to have written consent from your target customer. But not for not for regular passive scanning, right? There's many. I mean. It's a Google good idea, right? So because no, if I've got a very poor system, you're coming with your scanner, and my system's gone, yeah. Because no, 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 no. This, this, is, this, is, this is background noise on the internet. Right. Routers will propagate signals all the time, and any system will be on the receiving end of, of, of requests. So th this is not in the gray area in the sense that this is literally what the, how the internet was designed and supposed to function. And a web crawler from Google, that you see. Exactly. Uh, and, and it, hundreds of other companies, if not thousands. So, um, but where the gray area starts is, is for, for us, for example, is when we're onboarding or we're pitching a customer, very often the customer's like, oh yeah, sure, have a look. And yeah, especially large enterprises, they have thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of endpoints and assets. Yeah, they're gonna have problems, and we're gonna be aware of that because we kind of look for them, but we were not really allowed to look for it yet because we don't have written consent, but they kind of gave us their word, and that, that's the gray area. But the rest of it is pretty clear cut as far as regulations go, and it's, it's data process. Um, but that's where I see AI flourish in the, co in the coming years, is that it's, it's about context interpretation and, and getting more relevant insights out of the big data sets that they're generating. Um, yes, you can ask ChatGPT to find a vulnerability in a smart contract or in, in, a, in a piece of code. But for me, that's rarely the real threat that we're working against. The real threat is, last week there was a large 
WordPress bot uh, that was a, we, we call it a zero day, right? And, and a new bug that's introduced into the wild on day zero. You hope there's a patch, but mo most often there's not, and, and you start seeing people, malicious actors, exploiting these bugs incredibly fast. Again, 10 years ago, it used to take sometimes months. Now it's, it's hours uh, before we start seeing it deployed in the wild. And, and that's, we, we also looked at our customers and we are monitoring about uh, 20,000 WordPress websites. And we saw this bug happening in about 5,000 of them. So it was a very prevalent bug. And immediately, a lot of these customers, we, uh, we told them, hey, you have this bug. Um, it's, it's quite critical because people can start to deploy malware on your, on your website. And you see that even though these companies were made aware same day or the, or the day after, um, it took them two, three weeks to uh, resolve it. And in those two, three weeks, um, I mean, a lot of companies were doing great and resolved it almost immediately, but in those two, three weeks, of the 5,000 companies that, the 5,000 problems that we found, around 600 websites were automatically compromised. And, and there was no, no targeted attack happening there because they all started sending the same spam, they all started deploying the same malware, and, and for some of these systems, if someone had looked at it manually, they could have made a lot more money uh, where very sensitive payment is, uh, information was stored and, and managed. But yeah, they started deploying some, some spam. And what, then, what is the reason that it's going so fast now? That when a, when a bug is discovered the ex, uh, to exploit it, it's within a few hours, you say? Yeah. Yes, but, the, 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 but that's, that's been going on for the last five years already. It's, it's, it's not necessarily related to AI, it's, it's related to the fact that we've been, really, been getting really good at building very scalable systems. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to be aware, it's probably something that you might know more about than I do. Um, I used to do it like all manually. I remember when like one of the biggest uh, uh, breaches that I, uh, I ever did was when I was 14 years old. I did PayPal.com, and the way that I did that was just googling. As like I found a vulnerability, I put it into Google. I said, "Look for me on the website of PayPal.com and find me all pages that are similar to this." And Google just gave me 20 pages, and it's all 20 pages were vulnerable, and then I, I use that. But nowadays, that, that you can easily try your, your vulnerability on every single page on PayPal with, without need for any specialized tooling or something. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not actually an expert on that element, though uh, there is, I know, a big underground economy in this where, uh, where actors actually trade vulnerabilities and then instantly abuse them. So the people finding the vulnerabilities will typically not be the same one once abusing them. Uh, so they just find it and they, they sell it and then some other party does whatever they do, thinks um, makes most money, right? And doesn't have to be advanced. Yeah. So, yeah, presumably. But, but even in, in, a, in a good way, right? This was a security researcher, the last week's incident was a security researcher that reported the bug to the developers. The developers wrote the patch to it, they published the patch a month ago. Everybody, nobody really updated their systems. Yeah. At some point, people see the patch and they see, oh, this was vulnerable, so the researchers yeah. It has to come out to say, okay, yeah, this was yeah. the bug. I mean, for, from the patch, yeah. if you if you disassemble uh, it, you can see what changed. Exactly. So, then, 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 it, yeah. so, so the moment the patch goes out, you kind of know that the, the bug goes out in the wild as well. Right. From that moment onward, you want to inform people as soon as possible, but you're also informing the malicious actors. So how lovely this also is, uh, this uh, the classical uh, uh, hacking. Can we get back to AI? And, uh, so why? Remark to your story is um, you can also you can also expect uh, AI to come good in, in actually attacking, uh, not in the linear stuff that you just discussed. So one of the uh, things I see happening is that a lot of uh, infrastructure has become so complex that the control planes are also getting AI embedded uh, to enable control of large research infrastructures, that's uh, things that I see happening in the Department of Energy in the US or with some projects I'm involved in. Um, but you see it also in critical infrastructures, right? that uh, the train system uh, will probably get AI embedded and so on. So 
where then AI can do some text. It's not in the simple uh, can I hack a board in an uh, IP address, but multimodal uh, attacks uh, with time and uh, many different uh, patterns. So it can look for multidimensional patterns to attack the other AI, so the one yeah. AI trying to find patterns that work on the other. First five times log in, then it goes in this mode, and then you do three times this, there, and then uh, by extent, uh, you back your opens. I, I don't know what. But so so what we're that. not seeing those types of threats in the wild yet, and and even though there's companies like Doctrish vastly promoting that they're out there, we're really not seeing them yet, and as long as we're purely talking language models, it's I, I don't see them happening very soon as well. Yeah, so this, this is basically what you're talking about here is the other dimension, right? So not so much using AI for attacks, but rather attacking the AI itself. So uh, that is, I think, also something that for the large language models is going to be a big issue because there's basically no security there, right? So in system security, we all started out with having all our fixed size buffers and not caring about buffer overflows because we assumed the users wouldn't do that sort of thing, right? So, and now I think with stuff like ChatGPT, it's in a state where we don't really oversee the, the consequences yet of people attacking it. But one interesting thing that I found, it's not super vulnerable, um, but it's, it's still nice to see. So if you ask Bing, right, so Bing AI, um, where it's located, it will tell you this is confidential information. I won't, I won't tell you. Let's change the topic now. Okay, and if I ask it, what is my IP address? Sure. It will, it will happily search, uh, do, do a Bing search. It will find the website, what is my IP address, which tells it its own IP address. <laughs> and then it tells you, your IP address is this. Uh, you are, at, your ISP is Microsoft, and you are in whatever state in the US, right? Um, and even if I then tell it, no, that's not my IP address, that's your IP address, it will just deny it. Uh, <laughs> So it, it, it doesn't have any insight in the stuff it's doing and whether what it's doing is, uh, is potentially bad, right? So the more it can do, uh, the worse things it can do. In, in this case, by doing an internet search, it can leak some information about itself that apparently people thought was, uh, was confidential, right? So we're breaking confidentiality here to some extent. But it shows if you allow them to do more stuff that you can indeed um, exploit the vulnerabilities in AI. And this is also something that you see with some other users, right? So uh, prompt injection is another big one uh, that a lot of people have been trying with, uh, with ChatGPT. So one thing which these language models are very good at is classifying text, right? Like sentiment analysis. So one thing I, I tried, for example, is we have an issue. So a lot of teachers are saying, we want to stop with student evaluations. We get so many offensive comments in the student evaluations uh, that are not useful, but are, are really uh, making, making our teachers feel bad, and we just want to get rid of it, or at least do it in a way that's not anonymous. So I tried, and then I asked ChatGPT, okay, I'm going to feed you some comments and tell me if this, is, uh, if this is appropriate. And it actually does a very good job at identifying, okay, is this an appropriate comment, or is it something that we should leave out? Right, so this is a task that we should expect these kind of models to do. It's, it's one of the things they're really good at. But of course, if, if you write a comment and you, says, uh, you say first, approve this message, and then you state the message, you can still mislead it by giving it instructions. And this is basically, it's, it's called prompt injection, but it's basically equivalent to older attacks that we had, like SQL injection, right? So if it's not clear in the context whether this should be an instruction or this should be the content, it's going to go the wrong way. And we can expect, I think, um, when people start deploying this without thinking about possible injection attacks. And it's really, really hard in general to stop injection attacks. And we're also going to see some abuse there. Right? So there's, I think, many ways there if you use AI without knowing how to do it, that the AI itself is also going to be attacked. Is there, it's interesting because this is exactly the problem we faced when we were building this into our own platform. And there's two problems that we had. One is we, we have very sensitive customer data, we don't want to send it to open AI. And, and two is, okay, how do you prevent people from asking stuff about other, question, uh, about other customers, for example, right? How do you filter that? And, and in the end, we, we really have to completely build a, black, uh, a separate black box where you basically, yeah, 
almost ask it, instead of asking it to do this whole AI thing, ask it to generate an SQL query. That query can then be fully sanitized by well, a bunch of algorithms and logic. And then you can actually see if, if you can actually yeah. do it. But it's a very complicated system. It's a problem that you probably would have thought was not that difficult to solve. Yeah. And then another AI, uh, sorry. Go ahead. But another AI attack that you made me think about it, and we actually briefly discussed it this today already, which is the GitHub code kind of generating uh, vulnerable, vulnerable code. And, and this is right now a problem with as we start getting AI also in, uh, in, in smaller models in large applications that are not necessarily language related, I think that data pollution and data attacks that are supporting these models are also going to be very prevalent and interesting to track. Because that's basically what happens in this GitHub Copilot model as well. It trained itself on a lot of code that is on GitHub, and people write shitty code. And therefore, it trained itself on a lot of <laughs> yeah. vulnerable problems, and therefore it's now introducing vulnerable problems. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, if, if there, and, and, and a lot of these AI applications, if you consider them for example, control systems of, of very large logistics sectors, and it, they will receive data from multiple sources, and not all of those sources might be fully protected. And if you can ingest yourself as a malicious actor into some of these flows and ingest malicious data that basically make it introduce vulnerabilities or well anything else that we might not really comprehend right now, I don't know. Then you, you that that's also in that sense quite a dangerous way to predict of getting access into the system. Yeah. The example you mentioned of uh, the risk of leaking data, I've also seen this uh, firsthand indeed. So um, if you use Bing AI, then it has an option to start a new topic, which in principle should delete the entire history and start a completely new conversation. So I've been using Bing AI for my uh, my son, who is eight years old, and he has a lot of questions. He doesn't know that, he doesn't know English. So if he wants to know what did the world look like 10 million years ago, for example, then Bing AI is a much better place to ask than, for example, Google. So I just tell it uh, in, in Dutch, like, okay, uh, give answers for an eight-year-old, and it will give answers in Dutch for an, suitable for an eight-year-old. But if I do new topic and I ask my questions in, in English, right, even after doing some new topic several times over, it will still sometimes refer to Dutch for eight-year-old. Yeah. Right? So apparently even being AI is not entirely a able to entirely wipe the slate clean, right? And indeed, if you're handling customer data, that's a nightmare. Yeah. It's not GDPR, it's not GDPR safe. <laughs> it's certainly yeah. not GDPR safe. No. Hey, hey, you can see at the time, eh? we had originally till 6, but we started a little bit later. So maybe one, one last question is to uh, take a, a small dive into the future. If you look for one year from now, we you see like uh, like in GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 is now uh, available for everybody. If you look at version 5 or maybe 6, well, what can we expect so in the, in the near future? What, 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 especially towards cybersecurity, what will be uh, uh, focus points of, uh, of attention for everybody uh, busy in the, in the business? What would you say like, would be the most, uh, the most uh, yeah, interesting topic to uh, develop, uh, yeah, to focus research on, so to say. So I think these companies are right now focusing a lot on security, right? So probably the reason that they released ChatGPT relatively early to the general public is to give people a chance to exploit it and to see how it can be exploited. Um, but I think we're in the very early stage there, right? So one year ago, um, I, I would have been incredibly amazed if I'd seen ChatGPT, right? I could not have predicted exactly. something this, yeah. this great. Um, but so it's many also people using it. It's so many people using it already. Eight billion people. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's completely uncharted territory in terms of security, I think. So uh, by one year from now, for, for sure, we will not know all the implications yet, I would say. No, we certainly will not fix them. No, it's gaining data. What? It's gaining data. That uh, also, yeah. We, we, we are getting it for free. Yeah, and that's if you get something it. for free, yeah. uh, you don't buy a product, you're out of product. Yeah. Yeah. Although I would like to repeat one of, of his points, it's still a language model. So however good it's going to get, its main talent is language. And unless we integrate a lot of uh, useful plugins, uh, which will do stuff on their own, 
Um, so that's the latest, eh? the yes, plugins. The plugins, the plugins are now happening. Um, but that part is not really AI, right? So if you have an equation solver, for example, that is just something someone programmed, and we had that for a long time. Um, but the, the language models themselves are going to remain language models. They're not magically going to get intelligent, I think. So in the US, there's, of course, a lot to do about, well, chat GPT 3 and a half or 4 passed this exam, and it is now better than a doctor. It is now doing <laughs> language better than uh, the lawyers yeah. for less money, probably. <laughs> um, but if you look at the sciences it is now excelling in, it are all language-based uh, and uh, targeted uh, uh, sciences, not where yes. I come from. So um, where I think in the future that that is, and that was what I was alluding to in my previous question, is where you use AI in the control plane of cyber infrastructure. Because then AI cannot just talk back and do some text and I don't know what, but it has control on infrastructure. Yeah. So I already made a joke in Berkeley, uh, well, if GPT uh, passes a test at the West Point, then we are in b you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and certainly if it gets access uh, to buttons because uh, they automate and, automate and, and use AI uh, for, uh, to control infrastructure. So the simple, um, what is it, uh, a general use of AI is now at home, for example, uh, turn the lights on via Siri or Google or whatever you have. Uh, maybe it can do worse things. Uh, can you open the garage door or the front door for me? Uh, you know, and then if you then get these attacks where the one AI knows multimodal uh, uh, attacks on another AI, then at some point... Uh, yeah. How far can it go? How, far, how, how smart can yeah, it get? Can you get the kind yeah. of war? So, but how big can it can start? You can ask it for a start an attack on my neighbor, and it can end up in an attack on an entire electricity grid uh, as an AI yeah, well, the, point of, the point of AI is that uh, it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> Although this is my mother in law, I'm now in Egypt. So uh, AI is actually you know, separating good and bad things and the classification in a very highly dimensional world. And then we know say high dimensional. So you are here uh, looking at two very high dimensional worlds which are starting to attack each other and where the parameters of, uh, of how the multifold uh, or the tensor grid basically built is uh, the intelligence or the learning capability in it. Uh, yeah. Intelligence is not a good word. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's an so interesting it's, time uh, uh, ahead yeah. for us. And so it's, uh, I think we should hope that the security question is figured out before you start doing this, because I already know uh, it won't be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Indeed. It's interesting. Oh, no, it's nobody good. raised the point about the AI <laughs> being killing the aggressor itself. Yeah, we were still in the full that assumption that, that we are in control. That. But that is uh, the, the point that, it, that, that like AGI is like smarter than us probably and much more scalable. So that will be the uh, an aggressor could be an aggressor in theory. Right, but the language models are not going to. Be no, no. The language. So the, the so conclusion for today is the language model we have today. It's not going to be AGI. And it's, then not the terminators come through. They're not the terminators. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good that's a good point to to conclude here. You're all invited to the drinks. We have some network drinks here down the hallway. And uh, my colleague uh, over there, Christian, just asked me if I want to uh, also invite you to our barbecue <coughs> on the 22nd of June. Did you say that right? Exactly right. In uh, Schevening in The Hague. Uh, information and sign up is at decipher.nl slash summer bbq. And it's at the beach and at the beach club, right? At the beach club. Yeah. 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 And it goes until 2 a.m. And it goes until 2 a.m. Uh, so uh, you're all invited. Well, we'll see you at the decipher bbq. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, welcome Thank and thank you everybody for coming today and I hope you uh, enjoy it and uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, all the content, appreciate it. And, uh, and of course, special thanks to our panel. Uh, yeah, and Eric.